Let me open up in a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that you've given us. We thank you, God, that you've given us light and life. You've given us your spirit to read your word, which is a light and life to us. Lord, we thank you that <clears throat> you've given us this Lord's Day. And we can take a break from work take a break from the activities and busyness of this world, come and rest uh, with each other and before you, meditate upon your word. And Lord, we pray that you would help us to do that now, that our examination of your scripture would produce in us <coughs> knowledge in accordance with holiness knowledge that is increasingly in accordance with truth and uh, that it would be written upon our hearts. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Last week, uh, we did part one of the Holy Spirit in our salvation and uh, somewhat provocatively looked at uh, the Holy Spirit kind of from, from the angle, from the lens of the... the um, accomplishment of what was done by the Son on the cross, that indeed what Jesus did in dying for us as the Messiah, the Holy Spirit anointed one, was to secure for us redeemed sinners uh, an ability to have the Holy Spirit himself. Well, I want to continue thinking through the Holy Spirit and salvation, and uh, I think there'll be a part three and part four, but here in part two, I just want to look a little bit more along that theme. Okay, the Messiah has come. He has been anointed by the Spirit. Uh, indeed, in his death upon the cross, uh, the Messiah has atoned for our sin and now secured a people by which the Holy Spirit can dwell in, not just with. And, uh, uh, and now what? Well, let's look at a number of passages. Let's turn to John 17. John 17. <clears throat> I'm going to start reading in verse 1. This high priestly prayer, just before he is about to go to the cross, he's about to leave his disciples, but he, he prays, and he prays, in their hearing, so that what he is praying, what he is communicating to the Father, he, he wants truth to be communicated to his disciples. It's a, it's a very interesting scene. You know, I don't know if you've ever had the uh, privilege of almost eavesdropping on somebody uh, who's talking about you. And I say privilege because they're talking about you in a loving way. Um, I remember eavesdropping on my dad um, when he was talking to his brother, and it was uh, the week where he started to teach me how to drive uh, stick shift, and um, and it was not flattering. <laughs> uh, he was like, "Yeah, I'm going to have to get a whole new engine after this week, I think." Uh, but here they're eavesdropping uh, on an intimate conversation between the son and the father. And it's about them and, uh, and what he wants with them. So verse 1, when Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh, to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God. And Jesus Christ, whom you have sent, I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. So he, he's clear that his ministry is just about to come to an end. He's clear that what he's about to accomplish on the cross is indeed going to be accomplished. 
And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. For I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them, and have come to know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, as yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world. And I am coming to you, Holy Father. Keep them in your name, which you have given me that they may be one, even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost, except the son of destruction, that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but they keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is true. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself, that they also may be sanctified in truth. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me, and love them, even as you love me. Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am, to see my glory that you have given me, because you love me before the foundation of the world. O oh, righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I have made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. So much here, so much to unpack. Briefly, just from a Trinitarian perspective, uh, the obvious truth that the Son is speaking to the Father. Uh, So we've already just undercut the lie that um, God shows himself to us in three different masks. No, 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 here the Son, a distinct person with the one Godhead, and we know it's one because Jesus prays that I am coming back to you, and we are one, and I, I want them to be one just as we are one. There is a oneness, and yet there's a distinctness. Secondly, uh, he prays that they would be filled with him just as the father is in him and he is one with the father so that they would have him now the question is he's going back to the father he's praying father i'm coming back to you and yet i want to be in them just theologically how does that happen how can the son who will presently mm, that's not the right word who will physically be present with the Father, also be in us, whom he's praying for. Keith. One option could be that though he as man has a physical presence, he as God also is um, omnipresent. Yeah, that is, that is good. Yes. Um, <clears throat> and yet... And yet he prays, I'm not praying for the world, I'm praying for them. So he is omnipresent, and yet there's a distinction that he wants his presence, as it were, to be a distinct presence that's different from his omnipresence, uh, which everyone indiscriminately of belief or not enjoys. So I pose the question again. I think I think the clue here might come in verse 7. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. 
throughout his ministry, he has been consistently relying upon and walking in the Holy Spirit. This is what we looked at last week. As the Messiah, he is the anointed one. He is filled with the Spirit. He does work by the Spirit. He casts out the evil one by the power of the Spirit. And the Spirit is from the Father. Remember at the beginning of his ministry, he goes to John the Baptist. John the Baptist baptizes him reluctantly, but baptizes him. And immediately upon that baptism, what do we see kind of supernaturally happen? Two things. First thing is, God the Father thunders from heaven. This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. Second thing, the Holy Spirit descends as in the form of a dove resting upon Jesus Christ. And then from that moment on, his ministry, powerful and miraculous, is on the go. So I think here in verse 7, he's acknowledging, Lord, what you have given me, everyone knows it's from you. And the rest of this prayer says now, may that be true of them as well. I was in the world, now I'm sending them out into the world. He's praying that they would be sanctified, filled with, uniquely set apart for the continued ministry of the gospel and empowered by the same power that empowered him, which is by the Holy Spirit. All right, let's turn back to John. Yes, Keith. I was going to say that there are, are probably two previous sections in John that, that help shed light yep. on this prayer. Right. The first is, is John 14, generally verses 15, uh, 15 to the end of the chapter. But specifically, um, Jesus says, if, if you love me, you will keep my commandments mm -hmm. and I will ask the father and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. That's the right. same language that Jesus yeah. uses to talk about himself being in them. And then certainly in chapter 16, um, uh, verses 14 and 15, Jesus says this, speaking of the spirit, he will glorify me for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. So the very similar language that Jesus uses in his prayer in 17 about mutual glorification and, and indwelling. Uh, so he will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. That's really good. Man, you're a good theologian. Uh, Sarah, why were you shaking your head? <laughs> it's all good. No, you, it was a wonderful flex. You nailed it. Um, <clears throat> we'll look at those passages a little bit more. Excellent. Uh, turn back to John chapter 7. <laughs> John 7, verse 38. <clears throat> Look, that was just the Holy Spirit testifying to us why we have good elders who off the top of their head can go back to these verses and, and, uh, and show us the context. <clears throat> John 7. I'm going to start reading in verse 37. On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up <clears throat> and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. This is an Old Testament allusion to the promise of the coming Holy Spirit, who upon his arrival, especially in the book of Isaiah, he will call, cause dry places, desert places, to flourish like a jungle. Now this he said about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive, for as yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. So again, we're getting here promises from Jesus that as soon as he is glorified, he will send this Spirit to work in those who believe in him. Now Keith already brought it up earlier, there is a sense where all three of the persons are omniscient including the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has never been not there. There's a no sense where you could ever say, yeah, the Holy Spirit's not there. As God, he, the third person of the Trinity, is there, wherever there is. Wherever there's a created thereness, there the Spirit is. And yet, there's a covenantal sense wherein upon the accomplished work of Jesus' death on the cross, his resurrection, and his 
ascension back to the right hand of the Father. Then, as the Father poured out the Spirit to anoint His Son, the Messiah, now the Father and the Son will send the Spirit to anoint and give power to those in the Son. And out of our hearts will flow rivers of living water. When the Spirit is given to us, there is life. There is life. This harkens back also to uh, Jesus' interaction with the woman at the well in John chapter 4. Give me water. And she says, why do you ask me, uh, a Samaritan woman? Uh, why do you, a Jew, ask me, a Samaritan woman? And he says, if you knew who was talking to, you would ask me for water, and I would give you living water. Interesting here, too, the connection between Jesus saying, I will give you living water, and yet here in John chapter 7, the Holy Spirit will be that living water which bubbles up within your believing heart. So again, a oneness, and yet also at the same time, a distinctness. I think theologically we can say, too, as the Western church has said, that the Spirit is from the Father and the Son. Uh, so the great schism between the Eastern Church and the Western Church is that the Eastern Church, that the Spirit, set, uh, the Spirit is from the Father alone. The Western Latin Church says, no, the Spirit is from the Father and the Son. And uh, this is just another one of those bricks in that, in that argument. All right, now turn to John 14. John 14. <coughs> I'm going to start reading uh, in verse 12. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. And greater works than these will he do. Because I am going to the Father. All right? Don't skip over that because... You will do greater works than me, not despite, not in tandem with, but because. So again, there's something to the ascension of the Son that allows those who believe in the Son to start doing not only the same kinds of works, but greater works. You know, like walking and your shadow just heals people. Peter, Acts chapter 4. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me for anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you. And will be, future tense, in you. A couple of things here. First notice the word another. He is not the helper. He is another helper. That's cool. Jesus was indeed a present helper. But in his absence, as he'll say in verse 18, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. In his absence, he will give another helper. <clears throat> secondly notice that this other helper will be with you forever jesus is going to leave them now he'll come back again and there will be a point in redemptive history where uh, we can say yes we will be with jesus forever but but from our perspective here in this momentary span of life that we call our life, which sometimes feels like forever, um, there's a great promise that if you believe in Jesus, you will have the Holy Spirit and he will be with you forever. At no point will the Holy Spirit leave you. Now, we've already seen this in previous studies, but this is unique and different from the Old Testament. The Holy Spirit anointed and then sometimes did not anoint. Psalm 51, dear God, please not take your Holy Spirit from me. That cannot be true of the Christian. Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, is always and forever, even as we die, 
upholding us and sustaining us and keeping us united to Christ. What a glorious, encouraging truth. So when you wake up at 2 a.m. in the morning, because in your walking after truth and in your increased sanctification, you begin limping and tripping, and you fear, my goodness, I feel like I've got more of the devil in me than I do the Spirit, you can say, do I believe in Jesus? I do believe in Jesus. I trust in him. Then you can say with Romans 8, 1, therefore there is no, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And you can say, according to John uh, 15, uh, 14, the Holy Spirit will never leave me. Which, by the way, which, by the way, just, just a point of clarification because there's so much confusion about this, that means the evil spirit can never take you over. You cannot be possessed if you're a Christian. You can be plagued and poked and have his evil arrows shot at you. He can lie whispers in your ear. He can get other people that he can possess to come mess with you. But you, as someone who has the Holy Spirit in them, can never be possessed by a demon. And there's the third point that I want you to see in this passage. Look again at verse, um, where are we? Verse uh, <clears throat> 17. Even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, that's fascinating, cannot. So just hold that because I don't want to unpack it now. But that, that's, that's, that's a good word that Jesus uses there. Whom the world cannot receive uh, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him for he dwells with you and will be, future tense, in you. Now again, we've done a study on this, but I just want to bring out again. Here's the distinction between with and in. Woman at the well, you all argue that we worship God on this mountain, we worship on that mountain, and Jesus says, no, 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 the day is coming, and I say is now here, when you will worship in spirit and truth. Now, the spirit dwells in us, no longer in the temple, but in the temple. Yes, correct. We are a church. Yep. Skip over to verse 25. Chapter 14, verse 25. I think, Keith, you read this as well. These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I think here in context, I'd like to do more work on this, but I, I've, I've thought in context here, this is just another name for the Holy Spirit. Peace. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. You heard me say to you, I'm going away and will come to you. If you love me, you would have rejoiced because I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. That's, that's just fascinating. A rejoicing at the absence of Christ. Why? Because he's going to the glory of the Father. Uh, he's saying, and if you, would, if you know that, if you know how glorious it is to be in the presence of the Father, it, it wouldn't be a sacrifice for you to let me go. You would rejoice. There's, there's a theology of telos. Life exists in order to be in the presence of God. You heard me say to you, I'm going away and I will come to you. If you love me, you would have rejoiced because I'm going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. And now I have told you before it takes place so that when it does take place, you may believe. I will no longer talk much with you. For the ruler of this world is coming. He has no claim on me. But I do as the Father has commanded me, so that the world may know that I love the Father. Rise, let us go from here. All right, another spirit is coming. Turn over to John chapter 15. John 15. (coughs) 
verse 26. But when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me, and you also will bear witness, because you have been with me from the beginning. So much there. Again, he uses the title again, the Helper, uh, and he will come. But, but notice, verse 26, when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father. This joint sending and yet a distinction between the Father and the Son. And yet he also reveals to us this profoundly deep truth about the person of the Spirit. That he is he who proceeds from the Father. Proceeds or is spirated from the Father. If you remember back to our study in the Holy Trinity... The distinctions and the properties that we give to each person of the Trinity are not unique properties, but they're origins of relation. So that the Son is from the Father, and the Spirit proceeds from Father and Son. And those are the unique things that distinguish and make distinct for us the person of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Um, you know, just briefly, we've talked about this before. Has the Father always been Father? Yes, unchangeably so, which means that he has always had a son. Um, from whence, eternal generation, he has always been of the Father or from the Father. Now, was there a time when the Son began to be the Son? No, that cannot be. It has to be an eternal relation. Because if there was a time when the Son began to be the Son, then he cannot be God, because God cannot begin to be. And if the Son began to be, then that means that there was a time when the father began to become the father. There was a time when I became a father. Uh, this October 29th, 2012. I think that's right. I don't see my family here <laughs> wagging their head now. Um, before that time, I was not a father. That cannot be true of God. For God to begin to be something that he was not before, that means that God changes. And if God changes, then that's not God. Because he's infinite and perfect. So, origins of relation. He proceeds from the Father. And then notice this, he says he's the spirit of truth. So, not only peace, but truth. And he will bear witness about me. Redemptively, then, what is the focus and the point and the telos and the purpose of the spirit coming? It is to bear witness about Christ. And no wonder... The church is now in need of the presence and the filling of the Holy Spirit because as the church grows, it is by the work and the power of the Holy Spirit in the church that the gospel goes out. The gospel increases, it spreads. And as we'll see here soon, without that Holy Spirit, without the power of the Holy Spirit with the church, as the gospel goes, if there was no Holy Spirit, the gospel would bounce off of hearts like a spitball off of a Russian tank. And you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. <clears throat> uh, lastly, John 16, verse 7. Well, not lastly, but lastly in this little section of John. John 16, verse 7. Actually, yeah, yeah. Let me start reading in verse um, 4. I'm going to start reading in verse 4. But I have said these things to you that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told them to you. I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you. But now I am going to him who sent me. And none of you asks me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, here's the, the title again, the helper will not come to you. So again, there's something about the death of Christ, the resurrection and ascension of Christ that secures for us the presence of the Holy Spirit. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, 
because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father, and you will see me no longer. Concerning judgment, because, of the, wor- because the ruler of this world is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Look over. Um, yeah, no, that's fine. Let me read, let me read for you something here from uh, Fred Sanders <coughs> on these three uses of helper that we've seen in John 14, John 15, and John 16. There is a careful progression here worthy of contemplation. First, in 14:16, Jesus mentions this helper enigmatically, not yet identifying him as the Holy Spirit. But the fact that Jesus says this helper will be given by the Father is important, and so is the fact that he is another. It means that Jesus and this coming helper are fundamentally similar. What Jesus has done, the helper will do. Ten verses later, in verse 26, Jesus identifies the helper by the name, the Holy Spirit, and identifies the Spirit's message as reminding the disciples of Jesus' words. Third, in 1526, the helper will bear witness. He was introduced as another helper, but soon becomes simply the helper. We do not speak of two helpers, Christ and the Spirit. The title has become entirely assimilated to the Holy Spirit. Jesus' own teaching leads us to turn the corner from the Son to the Spirit, marking both their personal distinction, another, and their inseparable work, helper. It is remarkable how much Jesus packs into this title of the Holy Spirit, and in particular, how much he thereby teaches us about the Spirit's relation to himself. There's even more here if we focus on the question of who sends the Holy Spirit. We learn gradually that Jesus asks the Father to give the Spirit, that the Father sends him in Jesus' name, that Jesus sends the Spirit from the Father, and that the Spirit proceeds from the Father. In the final reference, Jesus can say straightforwardly, I will send him to you, not mentioning the Father. All of this is true simultaneously, but it can hardly be put into a brief statement. The Son and the Holy Spirit are connected in so many ways at this salvation historical hinge where the work of Christ is perfectly completed and the work of the Holy Spirit comes to the fore. Very good. Now turn to Acts 1.8. We've seen this before. Steve? Yes. Um, we had a question back here yep. that maybe you could shed some light on. Uh, in, back in, in, ver- in chapter 16 of John, he says, as you just read, uh, if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. Uh, do you have any thoughts on why there's this kind of mutually exclusive presence? Why, why couldn't Jesus kind of uh, send the spirit while he's still on earth? the spirit come down as well yeah. and and does that then kind of have any influence on how we think through the eternal presence of the spirit versus uh there will be a time in glory when we do actually don't have the spirit because we'll be, we'll be back with christ oh okay yes good let me start with the last first i think we will have the spirit in glory in us yes in us and with us um The answer to the first question is not because of spatial reasons. It's not like a small elevator where you can only fit one person in at a time. Um, And it's not modalistic where, like, you know, God has to go back and take off his sun mask to come and put on his spirit mask. Those are the two wrong answers. I think the right answer, um, or let me say it this way, one part of the right answer, there there might actually be more, uh, is that... uh, as we looked at last week, the Messiah, the anointed one, needs to atone for our sin first. The spirit cannot dwell in impure vessels. We are um, cut off from God. We are covenantally under the judgment of God until, that is, the son dies for our sin. And, um, and the, the kind of final exclamation point on that work, the accomplished work of his redemption is not just his dying, not just his burial, 
not just his resurrection, but his ascension. And at that moment, when he sits down, a final, <sighs> the work is done. Then he sends the Holy Spirit. So I think the answer is why does he have to go back? Because he needs to redeem us first. And then once we're redeemed, uh, that is seen as righteous, justified, um, then he can send his Holy Spirit. Do you want to add anything to that? Linda? Yes, correct, correct. All right, Acts 1.8. <clears throat> uh, starting in verse 6, So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know these times or seasons that the Father is fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. So there we're seeing the fulfillment finally of what he's promised back in John uh, with what will happen at Pentecost. And once Pentecost happens, the church goes out and indeed the kingdom grows and it spreads over the whole world. Not just Jerusalem, but to Samaria and to the ends of the earth. All right. The Spirit applied, and this will hinge us into part three for next week, but let's look at two passages. First, Galatians 4. Four through seven. We shall start in verse one. I mean that the air... As long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he is the owner of everything, but he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who are under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. So here we see the logic of Paul, first, we needed a redeemer who was both God and man, born of a woman. We needed a redeemer who was born under the law so that he could truly live righteously according to every commandment, every detail of the law. And we needed a redeemer who um, died for us in our place so that, verse 5, we might receive adoption as sons. Before that event, before his death on the cross, before the son died on the cross, we could not become sons, truly. But because of his death on the cross, his burial, resurrection, and ascension, we can receive adoption. And because of that, verse 6, now God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father, Abba, Father. So the spirit is the one who works to bring us to a confession that God is no longer judge. God is no longer some just vague God, Elohim. God is Abba. Daddy, Father. An intimate relationship has begun that was not there previously. So, the rest of our time this morning, let's look at um, one of the most remarkable passages on the work of the Spirit in bringing us to that point. Here we start to see the Spirit um, applied to us, or to put it in the words of John Murray, redemption accomplished and applied by the Spirit. John chapter 3. We all know it well, but always good to come back to this passage. John chapter 3. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. 
Now, just, just stop there. This guy knows the law. He knows it well. And he's a part of the Jews of whom in Exodus we know Israel is referred to as the son of God. So in one sense, he might be able to claim sonship. And yet, we've just seen, unless the Spirit is at work in you, you cannot cry, Abba, Father. Unless you've been redeemed by the Son, that title is not a full title for you. Pharisee named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, this man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Yes, correct. Very miraculous, powerful rabbi. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, or you could translate that as born from above, both work, both can be true too at the same time, born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, you guys remember the old uh, Amelia Bedelia books? Uh, the maid who over-literalized everything? Her hermeneutic was very, very wooden. Um, and uh, so Nicodemus does the same thing here. How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? So he over-literalizes. Um, Jesus, that's weird. <laughs> that's an awkward image. Jesus answers, verse 5, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. There's a lot of debate about what he means here by water. I tend to think that he's using here a synecdoche to speak about the Holy Spirit. Oftentimes, as we just hinted at earlier, especially in the book of Isaiah, the pouring out, think of that, pouring out of the Holy Spirit is visualized or, or um, uh, imagined as a pouring out of water. Remember, Isaiah talks about when the Spirit comes, dry places will become like a flourishing jungle. Maybe there's a theology of connection here to baptism, but I'm, we won't explore it now. Unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. Okay, so mom and dad know each other, and as a result, pregnancy happens, and as a result, birth. That's a fleshly, normal, the way God made the birds and the bees, birth. But, verse 6, that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Which means to say, everyone born of the flesh is not born of the Spirit. This is exactly what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 14. The natural man cannot understand the things of the Spirit because they are spiritually discerned. The idea is that we come into this world naturally. Everybody has a mom and a dad. And that has no connection, this side of the fall, no connection to you being a child of God. It has no connection to you knowing the gospel. Not even if your parents are Christian. Yes, as a Baptist pastor, I want to emphasize that. You come into this world fallen and spiritually blind. So you can be born, but have you been born again by the Spirit? This is, this is the theology that Jesus is beginning to unpack with Nicodemus. Verse 7. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. Uh, emphasize that must. There is no salvation outside of being born again. Um, Jimmy Carter did not come up with this language. This is Jesus' language. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear it sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. And we all know he's playing on words here. The Greek word and the Hebrew word for spirit is synonymous with the word wind. Right? So in Hebrew, ruach, you would, if you see the leaves blowing, you would say, oh, the ruach is really blowing hard today. Or you could say, ah, the glory of the ruach, which is filling the Holy of Holies in the temple. 
the glory of the Spirit. The synonymous, um, not synonymous words, but um, is it, it's not homonym. What's the, what's the grammatical term? Is this, no, not synonyms. Because wind is not spirit, and spirit is not wind. Yeah, it's, it's not homonym, I, yeah. There is a word, man, we all must have, yeah, same word, two meanings. We all went to PG County High School then, huh? <laughs> all right. Um, we'll find it. Continuing on, the wind blows where it wishes, you hear its sound, but again, you do not know where it comes from or where it goes, so it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. I can't catch the wind I can't see the wind, I just see the effects of the wind, and neither can I properly harness the wind, like I can say, hey, come here. I get it, we can harness it with windmills, I I don't mean like that, I mean direct the wind when I want to, no, 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 no. The wind goes where it wants, so it is with the Holy Spirit. Now, we'll unpack this more next week, for a theology of salvation, what this means is that being born again precedes belief in Jesus Christ. For a long time in American theological discourse, and this really ramped up with the introduction of D.L. Moody and was kind of the status quo um, uh, for, for many decades after him, it was taught, I think quite wrongly, that you believe in order to be born again. You want to be born again? Believe in Jesus Christ. The theology here that Jesus is unpacking to Nicodemus is that no, 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 no. The Spirit makes you born again in order to believe in Jesus Christ. Now, I'll unpack that more next week. But, but I just want to, I want to get here at what Jesus is saying, that it's the it's the direct will of the Holy Spirit that we don't see who's, where he's coming from or where he's going, that he blows upon and works on individuals. So just to unpack this more from the theology of John, remember how John begins. John chapter 1, um, <clears throat> uh, uh, verse uh, 12. To all who did receive him, that is, who believed in Jesus Christ, He gave the right to become children of God, born again. But, what does Jesus say, or John say? Who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So it wasn't even properly my decision to be, become born again. It was the decision of God by the Holy Spirit by which we're enabled to become born again. Remember, um, we all come into this world Flesh of flesh, blind, spiritually undiscerning. Our wills don't even want to believe until the Holy Spirit begins to blow and we begin to cry out, Abba, Father. Think about the analogy of birth. If you were born of a mother, that's all of us, at what point were you a part of that decision-making process? At no point. Certainly not in, in setting up the, uh, uh, the first date of mom and dad. <laughs> uh, y- y- th- there's no point in the natural scope of things wherein the baby said, yeah, you know what, it's time for me to be alive. That's just not how it works. And I think Jesus uses that analogy here to describe the work of the Holy Spirit. So again, I want to I un- under, uh, underline and emphasize that being born again precedes faith. It precedes faith. Verse 9, Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered him, are you the teacher of Israel and yet you do not understand these things? In other words, all of this is already there in the Old Testament. If you've read your Old Testament well, you would know this. Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, How can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? Uh, And then he goes on to give us um, 
John 3.16, whoever believes in him is not condemned. Um, uh, God sent his son into the world, um, and God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. We'll unpack that. I wanted to leave that as our end point because next week we will look at, okay, what, is it, what does it mean to be born again, to be regenerated, and then what are the effects of the Holy Spirit upon our regeneration? Any questions um, before we end this morning? Any questions about John 3, about being born again? There are a lot of questions. If you're not asking them now, then I'll start next week with them. Yes, Linda. Yes. So here's what we'll look at next week. The gospel is a command, right? Repent and believe in Jesus. And apparently, that can't happen until the Holy Spirit works on you. So if I can't believe until the Holy Spirit makes me born again, does that take away my responsibility to believe? In other words, is it unfair for God to punish those who don't believe? Is it unfair for God to punish, to condemn those who who don't believe. Because if they don't believe, isn't it the case that God has not made them born again? And if God has not made them born again, then how can God hold them accountable for not obeying the command to repent and believe? I think there is a good answer to that, um, but I'll let you wrestle with it this week. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time, and we pray, Lord, that you would Have your spirit to work within us now as we come to gather you for worship. Lord, we admit that outside of the work of your spirit, not only can we not believe, but we cannot even worship you aright. So we pray, Lord, that your spirit would indeed equip us, enable us, illuminate to us um, our Savior so that we might worship him and exalt his name. And it is in his name we pray. Amen.